Hello and welcome to the Slingshot channel. <laughs> Today we're gonna test these two amazing Ottoman swords that have been sent to me by swordbuy.com. Now normally I would charge like a few thousand for a review like this one because I actually have to invest all my time in things. But these guys could not afford it. Uh, they're just starting, I think. They started their business like five years ago. But luckily, my trusted sponsor, Plarium, decided to jump in and actually sponsor this video. <laughs> and I am grateful to these guys for two reasons. Reason number one is, without Raid Shadow Legends, I'm not sure I, how I would have survived the uh, quarantine when I had to go to England this winter. So instead of really falling prey to boredom, all I had to do is start Raid and I had it on my desktop, uh, on my laptop actually as well. And it gave me many hours of game fun. So it was so much better to climb up the Tower of Doom <laughs> and fight the Dragon Lord instead of just sitting there watching uh, UK television. Now what I love about the game is that on the one hand you can actually summon champions and then there's an element of luck how powerful the champion is going to be, but I also love just to let the automatic gameplay mode run so I can keep fighting and fighting and fighting while I do other things. And then when I see something interesting is developing, I can just focus my attention back to the game. I just love that. And I also love that um, I always win. <laughs> and then of course I was very busy in the UK filming for my upcoming TV show Backyard Ballistics. It's going to premiere in October, I think. <laughs> In any case, uh, now that I have some more time, I will probably start playing Raid again uh, because now they're bringing up some really, really cool things. Now this summer, they're actually starting fusion events and you get a brand new legendary champion. They're also releasing five amazing new champions and each one of them really looks incredible. Here's the best things about Raid. First of all, it's free to download and free to play actually. Then also I love the looks. I think the graphics are just amazing, even on a cell phone, but even more so on the desktop. Then it's easy to play. It's very easy to play. I hate when it's too complicated to learn a game, but that's not a case with weight. Very, very easy to be guided through. Everything is fun. Then also I love that it's about muscle powered weapons that sometimes have magic features. <laughs> and as I said, I love the combination of luck and actually being able to have an influence on the gameplay. My favorite champion still is Ethel because I was lucky enough to meet that champion in person, an unbelievable woman being really, really, really tall and looking exactly like the one in the video. And that was when I visited Plarium uh, in Ukraine two years ago. That was a fun trip just before Corona came along. As I said, I'm grateful for two reasons. One, I already explained, very good game. <laughs> the second thing is that it actually helped me and a lot of other channels through the dark phase of um, the entire apocalypse. Now things are kind of back to normal, income is more stable now again and the rules are much more clear and I had some influence on them too. So now I find it easier to cope with the, uh, with the whole thing. But for some years, several years actually, without a sponsor like Plarium, this channel would not have been able to survive. So I would have had to close shop and go back to work. <laughs> which my wife sometimes says would have been the better option. I'm not sure. I love my job. <laughs> so please, if you haven't done so already, just download the game and uh, play it. Um, and actually you can find the links down in the text description and you will get some bonuses if you do that. Okay, so, so much for the sponsoring part. Now let's go back to swords. <laughs> They actually sent me two swords because uh, they asked me what kind of sword would you like and I said well please give me the sword that you think is best suited for real combat, for real use. So they couldn't decide <laughs> I think and they sent me two. Um, let me show you the two swords that they sent me. Now I do get a lot of offers to review stuff and when it comes to like Turkish or Ottoman swords most of them are absolutely just wall hangers cheap stuff that you can simply forget about. But when these guys contacted me and I watched one of the promo videos, I said I want to test it. <laughs> because they just like put it on, on wooden beams and drive a truck over it. And they even use it to cut through the decoration swords sold by their competitors. Uh, so I said, this looks like the real stuff. 
and actually they are in Yatagan, which is actually where they should be because that's a traditional place where Ottoman swords have been made for real. It's time for a little disclaimer. Well, you know, I'm gonna say a few words that I have never heard before and I'm trying to pronounce them halfway okay, but I apologize already uh, to all the native Turkish speakers because I'm sure I'm doing a miserable job. So I apologize, I'm sorry. The first sword that they sent me is the sword of Ertuğrul Gazi. Actually, he was a Bey of the Saljaks and a very important figure in the uh, Turkish history since his son was Osman and Osman actually was the founder of the Ottoman Empire. It's not really known when the guy was born but he died in 1280 and uh, he was the Bey of the Seljuks as I said and therefore he had a typical sword. This one here. Let me show you its features. This is a fairly light sword. They say it's about 1.3 kilos. It's very easy to handle. It is uh, highly polished, so it's a highly polished and very sharp blade. We're going to test the sharpness later on. Um, the handle, I think, is full tang, and they actually wrapped it with leather. It is kind of a little bit of, it has a square profile, but it makes it really, really easy to hold it. Of course, it's a one-handed sword, which is fine with me, and even for my large meaty paws, it's comfortable to hold. They put in a very serious fuller, I think that is the reason why the sword is so lightweight, even though the blade is fairly substantial. Um, and also they thickened it at the front to give it some front heaviness, which I think makes it ideal to just slash, maybe from horseback, but also definitely in a uh, one against one combat. It is a handmade sword and they sell it for 239 US dollars, which I think for a handmade sword is a major steal. <laughs> And of course, only if, uh, if this test confirms that this is well made, sharp and durable. Now the second one is the sword of the conqueror, Mehmed II. Now Mehmed II actually conquered Constantinople when he was just 21 years old. So he's a major, major, major figure in Turkish and Ottoman history. Um, his sword definitely is an interesting piece. It is much more substantial than the previous one, heavier too. Well, they, on the website they say it's the same weight, but I think this one clearly is more heavy. I will weigh it later on. Um, the design is not so different. It also has a pretty decent fuller, very wide, but the blade is thicker and um, also longer. I mean, this whole sword is a meter long, so it's a long sword. And this one also has a very comfortable handle made from several layers of wood and it's definitely full tang. Um, very comfortable to hold uh, and actually I found a picture of the true sword like what is supposed to be the original sword it's in the top copy museum um, and it looks a little different it has much more like golden ornaments on the blade but it also has like a a whitish very thin handle and I asked them why did you not copy this one to one and they said because they uh, just talked to people in their town, which is the Yatagan. Uh, this means that it's uh, very famous for his sword making tradition. And they said that people said that this is more like the original and not the one in the museum. And I tend to agree because this really is the handle of a fighting of a combat sword. The other one is probably more like a decoration piece. This one is also the most expensive sword they sell. I think it costs around 570 US dollars. And they also like, like the, uh, this is more like a, a brushed, a satinized uh, finish. And they even put my name on here. This is what they do for their customers. So you can have your name lasered on um, or anything else, whatever you want. And also they had like a special heat treatment that gives it this uh, little bit yellowish t uh, tint, which I really think is attractive on a sword like this. Okay, to really test the sword, if it's, if it's good for true combat, I have decided to go for three different test scenarios. Scenario number one is the tatami test. As you see, this is a tatami, a rice straw mat. And this is the traditional method used in uh, Tamashigiri practice. This means a uh, sword practice with Japanese katana swords. And those mats actually say are as strong like as a human limb. So like an arm or a leg. 
and they say that if a katana can severe it in one uh, slash, then uh, it can also do this with a human limb. So um, yeah, the, that's candidate number one. Then the head splitter test. Can it split a coconut in one go, ideally? <laughs> this is fairly hard, probably as hard as a human skull, I don't really know, but I can tell you it takes some force to split a coconut in half. And then the last one is probably an overkill, because this is actually a treat that I like to feed to Rolfi. Rolfi really likes them and he has his way with them when I give him one. <laughs> so uh, all the soft parts he ignores and uh, he cracks the bone, so he's a pretty strong dog. But on the other hand, this is uh, cow bone. This is probably shin bone, I don't know, but it's fairly thick really heavy, definitely thicker than any human bone you can find. So it is not expected that the swords really cut through all the way. It is the amount of damage that the swords cause and the amount of damage that these actually do to the swords. Of course in reality like a leg will be covered by lots of muscle tissue and so on and also some skin and maybe also some clothes. Um, and uh, a coconut probably also by some skin but not as much of a uh, of tissue uh, yeah, so that we have to simulate all this and this takes preparation so I'm starting a day early on this part of the sword review why does it take preparation well we have to prepare some ballistic gelatin so we can put this inside as long as the gelatin is still in molten liquid condition and then wait for it to solidify and then we can use it for further tests but this takes about a day and the tatami uh, mats actually have to be watered down because they are now very dry and very lightweight but to achieve the consistency that we need we need to put it in water for a night and then let it dry for a few hours so it's still kind of wet but but not all the way like dripping wet just soaked ballistic gelatin the wonder mixture <laughs> I actually a few years ago I visited the company that makes it Gelida which is only 15 minutes about where I live so neighbors really I visited them and and filmed them and interviewed them you can see the whole video down there I put the link in for you and um, they have now decided to make us the pretty much exclusive distributor for small amounts of the stuff so uh, we offer it in two boxes this is actually a box uh, with 800 grams of the powder it's really, really high quality powder. It's certified ballistic gelatin, so the FBI, but also German police have certified it. Um, so it behaves like flesh, really, once you prepared it. Um, you can get this in the small box, which is 800 grams, and that is enough for like a five liter bucket uh, full of the final mixture. Or you can get the big bucket uh, which should give you enough for about 22 liters of the stuff. So, uh, of course, it's uh, cheaper. <laughs> Actually, they come with little instructions in German and in English how to prepare it. There's actually basically two different ways. There is the certified way, which requires a lot of work uh, and it's very complicated, but it gives you absolutely reproducible uh, stuff. Or the quick method, that is what I use, simply means uh, get some hot water and stir it in and let it cool <laughs> that's good enough for me and i think it should be good enough for you too otherwise if you get it if you buy it you get the full instruction set to make it the fbi way but before we prepare the gelatin we have to prepare our molds since uh, this is a typical five liter bucket so one of these uh, small bottles is just the right amount for the whole bucket but as you can see if I put in the coconut here, it would simply swim up because it's basically hollow. So it would not sink, it would swim on the surface and probably you know, just solidify it at one of the uh, rims here. This is definitely not what we want. We want it nicely inside of the gelatin. Therefore, I've made myself a little contraption. A long time ago, actually two of them. And as you see, this will definitely then press down on the coconut. And as you see, the coconut rest very firmly against it and by putting them out or pushing them in a little bit those nails here you can actually adjust how deep you want the coconut inside of the bucket so as you see you put this on the bucket and then it's pushing down and then you put something heavy like a hammer or something uh, on top of it so it doesn't swim up 
and then you let it solidify. Very easy but effective solution. Now for the bones, I guess this is a little big for the 5 liter bucket, as you see it pokes out. Now you could get a different shape container, but I don't have one. It doesn't really matter because this part, this part really doesn't interest me much. Since I know that no sword in the world is going to crack this. <laughs> Only, only uh, Rolfi's mighty jaws can actually do that. In any case, I'm simply going to saw it off, then I'm going to attach some pins to keep it at a distance in the bucket. As you see, I sawed off the chunky part, uh, probably the uh, knee joint, <laughs> or was it the hip joint? I don't really know. But in any case, as you can see how thick the bone is, that's far thicker than a human bone will be. But now it fits nicely into the bucket, and as you can see, it can't really move inside of the bucket anymore. So all I have to do is put something heavy on top of here, fill in the hot water and the ballistic gelatin, and then I'm done. So I got myself some hot water. It's about as hot as a proper tea that's been cooling for five minutes. It should be more hot than 60 degrees Celsius and not boiling. Other than that, this is my ballistic gelatin. Um, 800 grams of it is about a volume liter. And um, this means that it's enough for one of these 5 liter buckets. Now what you have to do is you have to put it in while you steer it. And I use one of these paint steering things for it. Um, and then you slowly steer and mix it in because what you don't want is lumps. So now we can let it cool a little bit and also see the bubbles, the air bubbles uh, disappearing. And then we stir again and we do this a few times until it's a nice liquid looking a little bit yellow. One of the differences, why not using normal gelatin from the supermarket? Well, one of the differences is first of all, it's certified. So this means that it doesn't really matter what kind of bucket you get, it will always behave the same. Whereas if you buy it in the supermarket, if that gelatin has been made from, let's say, a very old uh, cow, then it will be more tough. And if it's from a very young calf, then it will be very tender. This is standardized. But the most important difference is that this stuff here actually will remain very transparent. Whereas most of the stuff that you can buy in the supermarket will be very opaque. So then you cannot see what's happening inside. And this is exactly what you can't use when you test it with weapons. So now that we have a, a clean liquid, it is time to put in our stuff. First we take the coconut, we put it in, and as you see it completely swims up. And then we push it down, we clamp it into the bucket, and then we'll simply put our weight on top of it. And now it can harden and it will be perfectly centered. And now we do the same with the bone. As you see this fits nicely inside. We put it in. So, okay, so as you see, it cannot swing away, and then we'll weigh, the, weigh it down. I made the other two uh, as well, so that we have one test example for each of the sorts. And therefore, as you can see here, this is a clear container, and you can easily see how nicely centered the coconut is between the nails poking down. Okay, one day later, <laughs> thanks for still being here. So now the entire thing, of course, has nicely solidified. We can remove the hammers. And now the problem with ballistic gelatin is that it's extremely, extremely sticky in liquid condition. So this means that this is not easy to be removed from the plastic container here. First thing that we do is I just you know, lightly press on this here. As you see, it's a perfect coconut suspended in ballistic gelatin. <laughs> and now, of course, we can do the same with the bone. And, as you see, a fat bone in its gelatin casing. 
Later on we put it flat, so we cut it, a piece of this off, so that we can hit it with the sword. Very nice. This is how it looks like when you water tatami or motel mats. So they have now been soaking for about, I would say, 14-15 hours. And it's time to get them out, to give them about an hour to uh, halfway dry, so they're no longer dripping, and then they should be good for the tests. Okay, so here is my tatami or motor. It's actually just right now, no longer dripping wet, wet, but still a little bit soaked. And it's actually pegged. I know there's a debate whether it should be pegged or not, but I think it will just simply fall down if I don't peg it. <laughs> so, the sword that started the Ottoman Empire against Tatami Omote. Let's see if it's up to the task and if I am up to the task. Okay, about this. Whoa! That was easy. It had a lot of reserve. <laughs> what a cut. Look at how clean that cut is. Absolutely not a problem. Wow. Wow. Let's see if I can also do it backhanded. Whoa! <laughs> it seems like it's easy. I don't even have to invest a lot of strength. Let's see if I can do it like in a more relaxed fashion. Yeah, I can. It's like cutting salami. <laughs> this is so easy. This is such a sharp sword. Unbelievable. Well done, guys. So, now we are using the Sword of the Conqueror, Mehmed II. <laughs> the sword that finished the Eastern Roman Empire. The sword that finished the entire Middle Ages. <laughs> yes, it's seen as an endpoint. You know, the Middle Ages began with the fall of West Rome. That was around 476. And, uh, and then ended with the fall of Constantinople, which was afterwards called Istanbul. <laughs> In any case, let's see. And I'm somewhat relaxed. I mean, my pack almost broke off. But I'm, after the you know, results of the first test, I'm somewhat relaxed that this one won't have a hard time cutting it either. Let's go for it. Oops. <laughs> This is so easy. I think it shouldn't be that easy. <laughs> Shoo! <laughs> Shoo! <laughs> no, one last blow. Sha! Whoops. Incredible. Now comes the skull splitter test. Coconut molten into ballistic gelatin. <laughs> so the idea is, of course, that I hit it full force. And let's see if it's able to destroy the coconut, even though that is encased into ballistic gelatin. Okay, I hope I'm gonna hit it. Like so, with the heavy part of the blade, that would be perfect. Sha! Whoa! Yeah, I sliced the coconut. Hit it a little bit off center, so I'm gonna turn it around and go one more time, because it blew off, but you could clearly see the amount of damage that it caused. Okay, one more time. Well, now the coconut is finished. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, that's a clean cut through the gelatin and through the coconut. I would say it has definitely passed the test. While the blade is absolutely perfect, um, the handguard here is a little loose. I don't think it would be a big deal to fix it again. Just needs a little bit more pressure, I think. Um, but definitely you can see that this part is a little weak for the brutal slashing that we've been doing. So now let's find out if Mehmet II <laughs> was able to actually split the skulls of the defenders of Constantinople with his mighty sword. 
I'm actually optimistic. <laughs> fresh coconut, fresh gelatin block. Let's see how it goes. Okay, seems like the same thing happened to me again. I hit it slightly off center. Yeah, I made short process of the coconut already. Let's give it a second blow to finish it off. Okay, yeah, I can do this all day long, I think. <laughs> and clobber the whole coconut to pieces. I guess I am just not the most talented swordsman on the planet. Actually, I never had any training, so forgive me for being lousy with the sword. <laughs> And in spite of all these heavy blows, there is nothing loose or rattling on this beautiful piece. Now we have the mighty cow bone in the ballistic gelatin. I think this is far more solid than any human leg or something. And uh, let's see if it can do something to it. It is not expected that it will actually really cut through. I think it's physically impossible. Um, but we will also want to see what this heavy object does uh, to the blade. So let's go. Whoa! Okay, first of all, the blade got a little nick. I'm not sure if you can see this well. You can Yes, I think you can see the nick in here, but it definitely caused a major, major cut into the bone here. Yes, let's inspect it. Definitely. Let's hit it one more time and see if we can replicate the effect. Whoa! This time I was inaccurate and look what happened to the bone. I broke it. <laughs> okay, one more time. Okay. Now I hit the other side and made short process with it. I think it's time to cut open the piece and see what's inside. Ballistic gelatin. So here is the effect. As you can see, it really destroyed the bone. The first cut went in fairly deep and cracked the bone all the way. The second blow actually uh, cut off a piece of this from the joint here. Yeah, those would have been absolutely fatal blows and totally crippling to the opponent. So you can see that it actually did this. And guys, this is just normal. So this is not the fault of the blade. A sharp blade has to be thin at the edge and a well-hardened blade, and this is a well-hardened blade, definitely is supposed to uh, rather break than bend. So this will never roll. It's like well-tempered and this means that it should break. And this can of course be uh, removed on the grinder very easily and that was very common practice back when these swords have been in action. Now let's see what this one does. Actually this bone is a little bit thicker than the other one. Uh, which is fitting because that's also a heavier blade. More sturdy, I hope. Mehmet, do your best. <laughs> okay, like this. Whoa! Also, the blade suffered a little bit, but not as much as the other, other one. Very easy to remove this nick uh, afterwards. Whoa! Bone splinters raining down on me. <laughs> Look at the cuts. Blow, bone splinters everywhere. Uh, that is a very, very, very solid bone. But 
the sword really, really damaged it. I think a human like arm or leg bone would have been cut through all the way. I love it because it's so lightweight and really quick. Um, uh, but the only thing that I don't really like is that this hair became a little bit loose. I think the people in Yatagan need to invest a little bit more focus on how to install this in a way that this cannot happen. But of course I was also really abusing the blade. As you can see in the small nicks. Actually I'm happy that this happened because if the blade would have rolled here instead of splintered then I would have um, questioned the quality of the uh, tempering. So, But this seems to be well, well done. This is a fighting sword and I really respect it. For the price of 200 and uh, what was that? 39 dollars. I think it is really a good offer. I've, I've ne really never seen a handmade sword as cheap as this doing such a good job. So I recommend it, but also I have some criticism. This is one point. I think these guys need to work on the scabbards a little bit more. I mean, there's nothing wrong with them in general. The only thing that I don't like is like details like these key rings here and so on. They shouldn't do this. I mean, this is like cheap stuff that you would find on wall hangers. So at first glance, when you don't really know the quality of the blade, you could actually mistakenly take this for a cheap tourist souvenir sword, which it isn't. So therefore, I think these guys need to put a little bit more attention towards details like this. Now the sword of the conqueror, uh, Mehmet II. This is a sword after my heart. It sits well in the hand. It is heavy. It has a beautiful blade. I also much prefer the satinized uh, finish. And as you see, it even survived mostly intact this brutal abuse that I put it through when I hit the cowboy bone several times. <laughs> and it is super sharp. Uh, the weight is hefty, but just right. So this is a sword that I can recommend and I s still think at $569 this is still a really fair price for it. <laughs> and I forgot to say it's also really really pointy. <laughs> so <laughs> Turkish or Ottoman swords. I hope you like this review because I enjoyed it. And please 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 don't forget to download the game <laughs> Shadow Legends. Uh, from the link down below. It's very important for me, for my channel and from the good guys at Plarium. So thanks for this. <laughs> and I hope you like this because that's it for today. Thanks and bye bye. <laughs> well, just for the fun of it, I want to know what happens when I shoot a hex nut into the ballistic gelatin. Probably not going to do anything to the bone, but let's hope that it penetrates the gelatin itself. Whoa! <laughs>